So, um, <clears throat> we're going to do uh, a couple of things today. We've had uh, three classes in which we um, spoke about different issues. We had uh, one class uh, before Yom HaShoah, so we talked about other historical catastrophes in Jewish history and how Jewish literature studied, uh, struggled with these uh, disasters, calamities, catastrophes, um, and, and God's presence, and what may have seemed to some is God's specificity in light of these atrocities. Then we had a class <clears throat> for Israel's 70th anniversary, mm -hmm. about Israeli history. We went through the text of Israel's Declaration of Independence. And last week we went through the Sefirat HaOmer, the counting of the Omer during this time of year. What are its agricultural origins? Uh, what are its uh, Kabbalistic applications today? And also the history of uh, the failed uh, revolt against Rome in the 130s, in the second, in the 130s, 132 to 135 the years uh, in the second century of the Common Era. Today happened to be Lagba Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer out of the 49, which became a day of um, traditional festivities. Um, so the day of the Omer is... Uh, the day of, the th of Lagba Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer, is the 18th of Yar, which is today. And uh, like Tu Bishvat, for example, and other uh, days like this, um, for example, we do not say Tachanun, which is a uh, supplication uh, that we normally say uh, during uh, the, the morning service and the afternoon service. Uh, we don't do that on Lag Omer. Because it's um, because it's a it's a special day. Historically, there was there used to be a fast on that day called the fast of Joshua. Um, one of the main customs of Lag Baomer is uh, bonfires in Israel. Uh, we don't exactly know why. One of the conjectures is, like we said last week, is that those who instigated the revolt against Rome may well have communicated with each other that the rebellion had started by starting fires on top of the hill to uh, send a message, right? They couldn't exactly text message each other, so they used fire to communicate. Um, we have um, other... Uh, another tradition is some people... Uh, play with a uh, bow and arrow, which is the way they fought back then. And um, in, in terms of um, Lag Bomer itself is not mentioned, of course, in the Torah, nor is it mentioned in the Mishnah or in the Talmud. The first time we learn of Lag Bomer is very later on roughly from the days of Rashi onwards, from the 11th century onwards. Mm -hmm. And, and um, different traditions were attributed um, to Lag Baomer. One of them is that Lag Baomer, the 33rd day of the Omer, is the day in which the uh, plague which uh, struck the disciples of Rabbi Akiva uh, came to a standstill ceased on, uh, on Lag Baomer. Remember, we said that the Talmud doesn't speak about the rebellion against Rome per se. Rather, the, the Talmud speaks enigmatically about uh, a plague that uh, took the lives of uh, 12,000 pairs of students of Rabbi Akiva. So, another tradition. So, the plague stopped. In other words, the... Uh, the bloodbath stopped of the revolt against Rome. Another tradition is that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai uh, 
who is a first century sage and to whom our tradition attributes the authorship of the book of Zohar, uh, got married and passed away on that date. And when he passed away, great secrets, sublime Torah secrets, Kabbalistic secrets were revealed to him. So the day he passed away? Right. So, um, and, and I believe um, that um, he was also born on that day. Like Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses was born, according to our tradition, on the seventh day of Adar, and he also passed away on the seventh day of Adar. Um, there's another uh, Midrashic teaching um, that the manna started descending in the desert um, on uh, on Lagba Omer as well. So, um, can we speak a moment about the Akiva and and Bar Kopa and? That he oh. declared. Well, we talked about it last week. We talked about. Well, it last we week. we missed one factor that I didn't realize. Which we, is that there was a horrific price for that rebellion. Oh, of course, we said it. It's called the Roman uh, uh, Holocaust, and hundreds of thousands were either killed or exiled, or sold to slavery and prostitution. Absolutely, it was a uh, it was a terrible uh, disaster. So Akiva is the one that declared Bar Kopa <clears throat> the Messiah. Correct. So, and thinking that he was going to do it, he was going to wipe out the the uh, Romans. And was Akiva responsible for the consequences, the the slaughter that went on after because Bar Kopa well, was no well, Messiah? Was he but, responsible? Uh, well, he yeah, I mean he he is historically responsible because he. Supported it as yeah. a supreme spir- as a spiritual leader and yeah. anointed Bar Kokhba as Mashiach. Of course, he also paid for it with his life when he insisted right. on teaching Torah in public, and he was executed. Yeah. So um, isn't that a place anyway? Wow. Isn't that a big black mark against Akiva that he caused the the death of hundreds of thousands? Of well, people? you know, anyway. it, I, it's it's something that we see throughout both Jewish history and non-Jewish history that intellectual and spiritual greatness is not necessarily synonymous with political prudence. Sometimes people are brilliant intellectually or spiritually, but politically uh, they are not. Um, you know, you can think of the consequences then. Or he miscalculated it, right? Yeah, Akiva miscalculated the consequences. So many people have a festivity on uh, uh, Lagba Omer because of um, because of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and um, and people light those fires or bonfires as a, as a recollection of the fire that engulfed Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's home on the day of his passing. So if you go to Har Meron which is by Tzfat in Israel, where it is claimed that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is buried, so they have massive bonfires and festivities. Um, and uh, other people objected to it. Other people said um, that uh, there is no reason why Lag Baomer should be a Yom Tov, that it should be a special day in our, in our calendar because there was no miracle performed on that day, and this day is not mentioned, as we said, in the Mishnah or the Talmud. Uh, so some people objected mm-hmm. to Lagba Omer, including, um, including uh, the Khatam Sofer, who is in many ways the founder of ultra-Orthodoxy in uh, late 18th century uh, Hungary. When Zionism got going in Israel, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, the Sabras, the founding uh, fathers of Israel and the native Israelis started re-embracing 
Lag Baomer because the rebellion of, of Bar Kochva against the Romans, even though it was militarily a disaster, does symbolize that historical phenomena of Jews taking arms against those who wish them ill. And that coincided well with the Zionist ethos of you know, reclaiming our sovereignty and having a, a state and an army to, uh, to defend ourselves. Resisting so, oppression. Exactly. So that's, um, so that's a, little bit of Lag, a little bit about Lag Baomer, since, um, since today is, uh, is Lag Baomer. But now I thought we would actually go uh, to the tour the second we had two tour portions last week mm-hmm. one was a Mot, the second one was kedushim mm-hmm. in kedushim we find the holiness code for the jewish people which is something uh you know needless to say worth looking at um much of this book we're reading at this time of year the book of leviticus of Aikra, is the holiness code for the spiritual elite of the Jewish people, certainly in antiquity, the Kohanim, right? The various offerings they had to put forth, the uniform they had to wear in antiquity in temple times, uh, the privileges and the responsibilities that they had. Um, but Parashat Kedushim is a um, sublime parsha that really talks about the holiness code for the entire Jewish people. So I think it's certainly, uh, needless to say, worth our while to try and take a closer look at Parashat Kedoshim. Kedoshim in Hebrew. Um, which, um, can be found on page 398, 399. Almost four bucks, three ninety nine. <laughs> and um, a penny. I also have the Rashi, so um, three ninety nine shows our life is complete. I have tapestries in mine. Yeah, <laughs> same thing. Oh, we have different versions here. Tapestries. Three ninety nine. That's Exodus. Wait, wait, wait. $6.99? I'm sorry, five ninety nine. I need to clean my glasses. <laughs> sorry, guys. Let me clean the lenses. Five ninety nine. Almost six dollars. <laughs> right? She means Kiddushim means holy in the plural. Holies, so to speak. Right? In Hebrew, there is kadosh in the singular, and kedoshim is holy in the plural. Uh, okay, we're all on the same page. Yeah. And Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, "Speak to the entire congregation of Israel." So again, uh, this is a holiness code for the Jewish people in its entirety, not only for the koni. And you shall say to them, "You shall be kedoshim." Because I, for I am Kadosh, Hashem your God. Uh, kadosh uh, in Hebrew really means separate and uh, to be set apart. So holy is an English word also used in Christianity. I, I think um, another very good word for Kadosh in Hebrew, in English rather, is distinct. To be holy is to be distinct. And when you are distinct, in that context, you're also distinguished, right? When sometimes you hear, this is a distinguished person, or you say about a soldier, he distinguished himself in battle, right? A hero distinguished himself in battle. What does it mean that he distinguished himself in battle? It means that he stood apart in his greatness, that he elevated himself to a different level that many people around him uh, did not reach. So that's what it means to be kadosh, to be holy. It means to be distinct and to be distinguished. Right? So God is, God is saying, imitate me, walk in my ways. I am distinct, 
you should be distinct. Distinct also denotes separateness. I am separate. I am... Um, ultimately, my essence is otherworldly. I am distinct from the world. Right? But I am otherworldly. So too you, I permeate the world. God permeates the world. God's energy permeates the world. But ultimately, God's essence is beyond the world. So too, it's a message, uh, a calling uh, for the Jewish vocation that we should be in this world, immersed in this world, paying our mortgage or our rent and going to work and paying our taxes and filling our cars with gas and everything that we need to do. But ultimately, we're also separate. We're distinct from the world. We distinguish ourselves by immersing ourselves in the distinction of Shabbat, by being distinct when we are immersed in prayer, by being distinct when we recite a bracha. So in other words, it's a call to be also um, not only worldly, but beyond the world. Right? Mm -hmm. Spiritual. Right. Not only immersed in daily life, in the mundane, but ultimately strive to live on a higher plane, which is uh, eternal, and, and beyond the world. So, in other words, be godly. Um, and, uh, and Rashi says that that's why it says that God says to Moses, address the entire congregation of Israel. It was a message for the entire Jewish people, and hence the entire people were gathered in Times Square to hear it. Okay? So we should um, act like God. God. I mean, yeah, we, we, should, should we should walk in God's ways. We should God. emulate God's ways. Yes. Right. Um, so... But we, but we can't say that we're God's being mortal. I'm sorry? <laughs> we can act like God, but not be God. <laughs> Correct. Right. Act in Correct. God's way, but not be Him. But if we're godly and we're mortal, aren't we more? Aren't we? Couldn't we say we're mortal gods? <laughs> in a sense, in a sense, yes, because actually, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, Mishle, attributed to King Solomon, "Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam," which means God's candle. Is, is a human soul. What is a candle? It's a temporary light, right? So each one of us is like God's candle. Each one of us is a yeah. temporary manifestation of the divine. So that is correct, right? That is correct. So where w there was another time, that's what I wanted to say, um, there was another time that Hashem told the entire people, you're all... I want you to all be distinct and distinguished. I want you to all be Kedoshim, Kadosh. And that is in Parashat Yitro, Yitro, right before the giving of the Ten Commandments, Hashem tells us, I want you to be a Goy Kadosh, a holy nation, right, a distinguished nation, and a kingdom of Kohanim. You should all be Kohanim. You should all be the spiritual elite. Unlike some uh, other traditions, religious traditions, where you have a clerical elite, which is supposed to illuminate the masses, and the bulk of the people um, are not steeped in religious learning are, and are oftentimes actually illiterate. So if you look at medieval Christianity, you know, uh, what was the... Uh, what? What was the liturgy in medieval Catholicism? Yes. Latin. Latin. So most, most people didn't know Latin. If you weren't part of the clergy, you didn't know Latin. So you would come into those massive, mag architecturally magnificent cathedrals. You would feel so minute in this humongous structure, but the whole thing would be mumbo-jumbo to you because you couldn't read, understand, or recite the Latin. 
Judaism, according to Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, is the democratization of the holy. We're all holy. All our children should learn Hebrew and be able to read Torah and lead services and learn, right? So it's not about having an elite that's the knowledgeable elite and everything else, everybody else is dependent upon them for enlightenment, mm -hmm. uh, religious and intellectual enlightenment. Judaism is a call to everybody should be, we should all be a spiritual elite. We should be a, a global spiritual elite in the positive sense of the term. Um, Rashi goes on to say that, very interesting, Rashi brings it down to earth from the sublimity of being holy. And Rashi says, what does it mean, Kedoshim, to you, you shall be holy? Heve purushim min ha'arayot umin ha'avera. Distance yourself from uh, improprieties in terms of physical intimacy. Right? What, what about physical? Physical intimacy. Separate yourself from sexual immorality oh. and from transgressions. So to be holy is also about, um, he shows in other contexts in the Torah, is about being mindful of that aspect of existence as well. Um, now, one would think that if we're talking about the holiness code for the Jewish people, how to be holy, how to be spiritual, what would you think the emphasis would be on, maybe studying Torah and praying regularly, right? Yeah. We're going to see that our parasha really puts the emphasis on Jewish ethics and morality as much, at least as much, if not more than it does on Jewish spirituality. This parasha of our holiness code places as much emphasis on our horizontal, interpersonal relationship with our fellow Jew and fellow human being as much as with our vertical relationship with the Almighty. And we see that already in verse 3. You should uh, revere, fear your mother and your father mm -hmm. and observe Shabbat. Mm -hmm. So it starts with the moral teaching. Right? In the uh, Ten Commandments, the Fifth Commandment is honor your father and your mother. Notice that it doesn't say love your father and your mother. This is honor them, give them a certain level of respect. Welcome. Page, you can't command uh, love. Page, correct. Page 599. 599. Uh, almost $6. Parashat Dushim. And here, actually, the mother comes first. You see? Revere your mother and your father. Um... And, um, and, and Rashi claims that why does it say fear your mother and then your father? Because he says that normally a kid fears their daddy more than their mommy. The kind of thing that when a kid misses up, he comes back from school. Wait till your father comes home. Exactly. <laughs> and your mother says, wait till your father comes home. So you should... That's, that's, that's kind of like what Rashi says. Uh, a child fears his, mother more, uh, his father more than his mother. And on the other hand, a child honors his mother more than his father, uh, since she wins his favor by words. Um, so, um, so first, you know, have the right attitude towards the people who gave you life, which is a moral teaching. And then Shabbat. Shabbat after? And observe Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, third uh, verse on 599. So Rashi says something really interesting. Why does honoring your father and, and, and revering, fearing your father and mother, why is it in the same verse of um, keeping Shabbat? Rashi says, lest you think if your father tells you desecrate Shabbat, then you should honor your parent and desecrate Shabbat. Really? 
Lest you think that. Lest you think that. You shouldn't think that. Oh, okay. Lest you think that. Make sense? Don't think that. A- and uh, Rashi gets very specific, uh, leaning on the Talmud and tracted Baba Metziah, for example. What does it mean to revere your parents? Don't sit in their place. If you're going to watch TV in your parents' home, don't sit where your parents sit. If you're going to eat in their home, don't sit in their seat. Right? Don't speak when it's their time to speak, and don't contradict them in public in a way that would embarrass them. So, so it's a very practical thing. Right? It's a very practical thing. That, that is, this is what it means to revere your parent. Don't take their place. Don't speak when it's their turn to speak. Don't contradict them in a way that would embarrass them and with other people. And how do you honor your parents, says Rashi in his interpretation? Um, you, uh, you provide for them uh, in terms of uh, food and drink if they need and clothing. And uh, you accompanying them, you take them when they enter and leave. In other words, if they need to go to the doctor, you take You, you help them go to the doctor. Um, if, you, uh, if, they, if they have monetary needs of basic necessities in old age that they can not afford, you help them with that. Again, very practical. There's a beautiful Hasidic story about um, um, a grandfather that lives with the parents and the child in old age. And... Uh, And unfortunately, uh, the grandfather has a tremor, and he can't really, oftentimes, he drops his uh, cutlery or his plate or his glass. So they purchase for him, uh, the, the father and the mother, his sons, they bought the uh, grandfather uh, wooden, a wooden bowl and wooden cutlery and a wooden glass, and they sit him at a separate table so that if he drops it nothing happens and they don't have to look at how he chews and sometimes the food comes out whatever so they put him in a separate table with the wooden uh, cutlery and bowls and, and uh, after dinner uh, one day uh, the father goes down to read a story to the kid and he sees the kid is uh, sharpening uh, a piece of wood And, and he's asking his son, what are you doing? What are you doing with this? And he says, what do you think I'm doing, Dad? I'm preparing a separate table and separate cutlery and a separate bowl for you so that when you're old, I'll put your table all the way at the corner of the room and you can eat there alone too. <laughs> right? It's a good, it's a good story. Um, so number four, numero cuatro, uh, don't turn to the idols. Uh, don't make the focal point of your life empty, fleeting things, whether they're tangible things like wealth uh, or whether they're intangible things like social status. Um, don't waste your life uh, serving idols, false gods. False gods persist. They just change their forms from uh, place to place, from culture to culture, from historical era to historical era. Um, now, uh, the next one, um, that... Um, yeah, and the next one is about when you serve God when you bring an offering before God which is about intentionality Rashi says that you should have in your mind the intent that you want to bring God spiritual pleasure by offering him uh, this gift whether it's today in prayer your time That, and your words and your heart and your thoughts, your feelings, or in antiquity there were physical offerings as well, that you should be mindful of the fact that, that, that ours should be the worship of the heart. Right? That's how the, uh, our sages define in the Talmud prayer. 
Jewish prayer is worship of the heart. Okay? When you're making a sacrifice, are you also asking for a blessing? Is that a blessing in return? You're giving um, it to God, you're giving offering and him, and is he giving you something back? Um, you know, in, in ideally not. Ideally, the highest level is lishma, that we do a mitzvah intrinsically for its own sake. The reward of the mitzvah is doing the mitzvah, the inner satisfaction and the contentment that you have for having fulfilled a mitzvah um, and how it internally satiates your soul and gives you a sense of satisfaction and builds your character and inner stature and integrity. Um, but uh, in some places uh, we do find that. We have in one of the parashot in Deuteronomy the whole script on Shavuot. People would come with a basket to the Kohen and they would say, it's also in the Passover Haggadah, you know, my forefather was a lost Aramaic and we were enslaved in Egypt and then God took us out to bring us this wonderful land of milk and money, I mean milk and honey, <laughs> and, and, and we thank God for that and for everything we have in our fridge and uh, also for the sushi we can order on Postmates. But then we say, Hoshia et amecha uvarechet nachalatecha. He says, and then we ask for redemption and blessings from on high today. So you do have that sometimes. But the ideal is uh, to do the good for the sake of doing the good. Um, and that uh, grows the spirit or the soul. For the sake of doing the yeah. good. Then we have a couple of verses, verses 7 and 8, that talk about the importance of doing a mitzvah in its right time. Uh, so in antiquity, if, if, a, if an offering would be consumed on the third day, it would, cons- it would be considered invalid. That's the seventh uh, verse. So it's kind of like saying today, you know, don't pray the morning service when it's 6.30 p.m. It's a little bit too late for that. Timing is important in Judaism. Don't celebrate Shabbat on Saturday night or Sunday morning. <laughs> Everything has its time. Uh, actually, I'll give you, I think, a wonderful contemporary example. There are people, I, there, I know, you know, I don't mean it judgmentally. I, I know people who, um, if Passover, the Seder night, falls on a Tuesday or whatever, Wednesday or Thursday night, they, they actually celebrate it Saturday night. They say, ah, we're too busy during the week and there's a lot of work. We'll do the Seder Saturday night because it's the weekend. So this verse is saying that's not the right way to do it at all, (laughs) at all. There's a time for everything, as King Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. And and mitzvot should, should be fulfilled in the opportune times. Sometimes we do have a second chance. For example... um, Four days ago was Pesach Shani, the second Pesach. What was that? People who wanted to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem on the original Passover day, but they couldn't because they uh, had some restrictions. They, they, they couldn't go because of ritual restrictions, so they could go a month later. Sometimes you can defer to a different date, but sometimes we have a saying in Hebrew, which means if the time passed, then the offering is, no, is nullified, right? So if I missed the Seder because I was uh, hiking in Tibet, and then I say to myself, oh no, I forgot that, you know, two, two nights ago was the Seder and I wanted to go to the main city to a Chabad Seder. Can I do a Seder tonight? No, <laughs> you missed the boat. Right, so don't. So, so that's pretty clear. This is what. Um, Very strong to say it's an abomination in this book here. Yeah, it is strong, but but I think, you know, it's a very deep thing. Um, I'm teaching a class now in rabbinical school uh, in. The- so. Um, so both Heschel and Soloveitchik. Um, both Heschel and Soloveitchik tell us that Judaism is about redemption in time. Okay? So, 
You find your redemption in the morning service. You find your redemption in the Kiddush and Hamotzi and the Friday night dinner. You find your redemption in the Shabbat practices and services. So you carve out these pockets of holy time and in those pockets of holy time that's where you encounter God and your inner core and your fellow Jew. And, and if you miss the boat on that time you miss the whole Jewish shtick which is to encounter God in time. That's why it's so important. That's why it's such strong language and abomination because if we lose the, the clock then, then we lose Judaism. There's a rabbinic teaching that when the Syrian Greeks wanted to annihilate Judaism as a living spiritual practice in the second century BCE with the time of Antiochus we're talking about the wars of the Maccabees the Hanukkah wars so the rabbis teach that the Greeks really focused on, on uh, invalidating and forbidding three chief mitzvot what were those mitzvahs? one was circumcision the second one was um, what was the second one? I think it was Torah learning or Torah study or both and the third one was Rosh Chodesh. Oh, really? Right? Oh. Because if you don't know what month it is, you lose track of everything. Then you don't know where you are in time. And if you don't know where you are in time, you can't do Judaism. Because yeah. Ju- Judaism is redemption in time. Right? Um, so, so, th- so these are actually um, under the esoteric cl- cloak of, of sacrifices. These are actually very important uh, mitzvot. Comes number nine, and again we see that the, to be the holiness code in Judaism is much about um, uh, social welfare, helping the needy. Right? When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not fully reap the corner of your field nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. This is a dignified way of giving. In an agricultural society, you leave it there for the needy to come and take it. So they don't need to be embarrassed. Right. Right? They don't need to be embarrassed. uh, You don't have to stand under the freeway overpass at the 405 in Wilshire. So we see how the Torah is concerned with the human dignity of, uh, of those who are... Um, in a vulnerable position. And again, we see that the Holiness Code places a large emphasis on how, uh, how we uh, fulfill our social and moral responsibilities. And again, it says, when it comes to your vineyard, don't uh, pick up the fallen grapes. Um, you should leave them for the poor and the stranger. And who is telling you that? I am the Lord your God. Right? It emphasizes how important it is. Notice it says the poor person and the stranger. You know, on Shabbat I said it's very interesting that we have both these uh, commandments in this portion of Kedoshim. One is love your fellow person as you love yourself, Mm -hmm. which is known universally as one of the greatest mitzvot. It's in our parsha. And you have another mitzvah, which is not as well known universally and globally, which is, you shall love the stranger, for you yourselves were strangers in the land of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, to love your fellow is an easier mitzvah than loving the stranger. It's easy to love somebody who shares your religious, cultural, ethnic, national... uh, background or political vantage point it's it's much more challenging to love the person who is different than you but the Torah demands us something higher than loving your fellow loving the stranger as well so um, and that's a very important time because we see in our day and age Mm -hmm. fundamentalist religious groups that really take care of their poor and of their own 
you can see some Islamic militants, Islamic fundamentalists, who really do take care. Why did Hamas get elected in January 2006 and the PLO lost the elections? Because the PLO stole billions from the Palestinians. But uh, Hamas actually took care of its fellow Palestinians. They, 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 they made sure they give charity, they fed those who are poor, they care about their fellow Palestinians. But what about the non-Muslims? What about the Jews? What about the Christians? How do you treat them? That's what the Torah says. It's very easy to love your own. Don't get me wrong. Some people de- don't, e- don't even love their own group. It is an achievement to love your neighbor who is like you ethnically and religiously and so forth. It's a great level. But if you're stuck on that level, it's a problem. Because that, that, then, that, you, know, you can love your fellow person, the one who is like you, your fellow Jew, your fellow Christian, your fellow Muslim, but the rest of humanity is either an enemy or someone you don't want to be in any contact with. But the Torah demands more than that, right? You should, yeah, yeah. you should love the stranger because you experienced on your own skin firsthand what it means to be the stranger, the odd person out in Egypt or in Greece or in Cuba or in Russia or in Morocco, wherever your family came from, to Israel or to America. So, for you are strangers in Egypt. So in many ways, Jewish history is a sustained tutorial in empathy for the minority, the vulnerable, those who are different than us, right? You know, I uh, mentioned two stories on Shabbat in my sermon. One is that my mother-in-law grew up in North Carolina during the time of segregation. As a kid, one day she drank from uh, the water fountain that was designated for uh, non-Caucasians. And, uh, and a woman came up to her and told her, little girl, this water is not for you, something like that. So that woman who said that to my mother-in-law may well have been a very nice lady in her own ethnic, religious neighborhood and community and church. But what about others who are not part of her group? Right? Um, so, um, similarly, there w- there's a man called Christopher Browning who wrote a book called Ordinary Men about a police battalion of German reservists who um, massacred tens of thousands of Jews in Poland during World War II. And the name of the book is Ordinary Men. These you know, were regular people, lawyers, CPAs, they were recruited to the reserves and they perpetrated genocide. But they were regular people. These were no sociopaths or psychopaths. When they went back home, there were still many of them very nice, loyal, contributing members to their, in Germany, to people who shared their ethnic and religious groups. They may have been wonderful Germans in their Protestant Mm -hmm. churches and their neighborhood. So, you know, oftentimes love your fellow person as you love yourself, love your neighbor as you love yourself, gets all the attention. And we forget about this other mitzvah of loving the stranger. So God really expects both of us. Mm -hmm. You know, on Wednesday night we're going to be hosting here Senator Joe Lieberman. Mm -hmm. He's going to talk about Jewish American identity in Israel. And and Senator Lieberman, when he was about 21 years old, he participated in the march on Washington with Dr. King. And and Senator Lieberman is an observant Jew, an Orthodox Jew. And who did he run into in the the march in Washington? His rabbi from Connecticut. Can you imagine that? 300,000 people he runs into his rabbi. So that's the ultimate, right? You love your in-group, but you also see the sanctity, the worthiness, and the divine image in every human being and every human group. Good? So, uh, 11. We go to verse 11. We see it again that the holiness code in Judaism is uh, ethical, right? Don't steal. And Rashi says... Um, something really in- interesting. When it says don't steal here, it means don't steal 
um, uh, monetary assets. Don't steal cars, don't steal money. But in the Ten Commandments, according to Rashi, it means don't steal means don't kidnap. That's Rashi. But um, again, uh, no uh, deceiving, no deception, no uh, no That's stealing. That's interesting. Jump to that conclusion, huh? Yeah, Rashi, right? Um, so I guess, but kidnapping is stealing no. someone's child. Or stealing something, or stealing uh, that person. Yeah, you're stealing a person. Yeah. So, a big. Uh, think about um, human trafficking, oh. right? Still a big uh, epidemic in our world. Yes, Mark. So a big uh, point: deal deceitfully or falsely. And the next one: do not swear falsely. So this is all about. Can we re- condense it into? No lying. Do not lie. It's it's forbidden to lie. Well, it's part of it, but it continues, you see. Um, But can we draw that conclusion that you're absolutely not to lie? No, no, not in Judaism. That's really interesting. You know, Immanuel Kant, who was one of the greatest philosophers of modern times, said that you should never lie. But that's not a Jewish view. You know, if it's a... (laughs) Really? If you are hiding a Jewish person in your home during World War II and the Gestapo comes and asks, are you hiding a, a Jew here? You should lie and say no. Oh. Right? Um, so there are certain instances where you're allowed to lie in Judaism. Some of the, you know, the, the clearer cases... That's because it, it takes precedence it, to save a life. Exactly. Oh. But, but actually the Talmud gives you a list of a few things you should... You sh- you you can you can probably should always lie, and one of them it's amusing is if you're going to a wedding, and a bride comes up to you and asks you, "How do I look?" <laughs> you have to tell her that she's beautiful. <laughs> it actually says that in the Talmud. Yeah, 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 yeah. What about the one? Is, does it's my dirty. tushy look big in these pants? <laughs> I don't know. I'll, 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 That's a classic. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll have to uh, check the Rashi on that. <laughs> Let's go to verse 13. Again, very interesting. Don't lota ashoket echa basically means don't, um, don't cheat or manipulate your neighbor in financial dealings. Which also would mean if somebody comes to you and says, oh, I just moved to the community, um, how much does this house cost? You know, and you tell him, um, five million dollars, when the house is worth a million. It means, I'm thinking of a better example, if you know a stock is going to crash, don't tell someone to buy that stock. So don't. Yeah, but that's a whole big old can of worms on that particular example. I would mm-hmm. not use that again because then there's that insider trading problem. <laughs> well, so it depends upon how you know. Well, exactly. And if you know from a way that it's insider, then you can't say don't buy that stock. You cannot. Right. So, but the problem. The... So don't use that example again. <laughs> okay, I'm not knowledgeable enough in in, in, in this. Uh... And supersede line again. What I'm saying is. Don't cheat people in sophisticated ways. That's basically what it means. Lotigzol means don't take somebody like for, else's like don't belongings. Don't sell them one thing and give them something else inferior. You know, something exactly. like that. Exactly. And, and, and the, the final part of verse 13 is actually one of the best. It literally means don't dwell the wage of your employee until the morning. In other words... Don't tell your employees on Friday, here's your paycheck, and don't cash it until Monday, (laughs) or I'll pay you next week. Isn't that fascinating? Because you think the Holiness Code in Judaism, they would only or mainly focus on the sublimity of being a holy person who prays and studies Torah all day. But no, they're coming down to the nitty-gritty of everyday life. Paying your employees on time. That's what it means to be holy. Ain't that something? Mm -hmm. Right? We're not talking about when a person 
you know, is not able to during to due to financial hardships. But when a person certainly can um, and doesn't do so, right? Um, now, verse fourteen, also very exquisite. Don't curse a deaf person, and don't uh, place an obstacle before the blind. What does that mean? Don't curse a deaf person. Don't take advantage of people who have these types of disabilities. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for example, you know, there was a wonderful member of our community who was honored um, a few years ago uh, by, uh, we have an annual or biannual award called Los Merecidos, those who merit, Le Meritant. Right? And we give it to people who distinguish themselves, right? Again, to, dis to be distinct. Distinguish themselves in service to the community. In one person who, like uh, basically almost everyone in our community who is an immigrant or a child of an immigrant, um, he came to this country and he started doing business. And at the beginning, people would, uh, people would do that to him. They would... Um, make him sign some contracts or something in English that he would miss the angle and then they could take away his money or... Take advantage of him. Basically, took advantage of him. Right? So, so that's what it means not to uh, curse a deaf person and not to put an obstacle before the blind. Right? And when, when somebody's not in the know um... Better, you know, the right thing to do is to um, not, you know, not to take advantage of them. Don't place a stumbling block before the blind is a, is a very important mitzvah. Rabbi. Yes. There was an incident where I worked and there, there was a really bad manager. She really harmed a lot of people, right? She died last week. So my coworkers start calling me and they're still say, saying how evil, all these bad things about her even though she's dead. What mm -hmm. do I say? She's dead, let her go? It's really interesting you say that today because last week, last Shabbat, five days ago, we read, we read two Torah portions. It was a double portion for Shabbat. One is called Acharei Mot, Achare. which means after the Achare. death yeah. of... And the second one we're learning now is called Kedoshim, which means holy. And what is this week's parsha? Emo. Emo means say. Say. Emo. Mm -hmm. Say. 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 Emo. Say. So, in Hebrew, in Israel, if somebody dies away, and they ask you, "How was this person? Was this person a nice, a nice person?" And let's say this person was the opposite of a nice person. So you say to this person, Acharei Mot Kdoshim Emo, which is the name of these three parshas, right? After the death, holy say. <laughs> In other words, after somebody dies, only say, don't say bad things about them. They already left this world. They have their accountability. They have to deal what goes around comes around. There's a certain dignity that we uh, must have towards the deceased. That it's, it's, it's considered in Judaism a very vile thing uh, to speak ill of the deceased. Right? Of course, we're not talking about serial killers. We're talking about people who are still within a certain normative parameters. Right? So... So we actually use the name of these three parashot, Acharei Mot Kedoshim Emor, which means after death, say holy. Holy, which basically means, you know, somebody passes away, that, you know, let, let it go, let it go. They're not here anymore, they can't harm anyone anymore. And, um, and they're going to have their reckoning. Right, and it's good for your own soul also to not be. keep because a score with somebody who's dead. I mean, yeah. it, I, I mean I'm not sure if it, it falls under uh, Ein Hara when you're speaking evil about somebody, if it's a fact, yeah, they did really do that. 
even so, if somebody did something bad, are we supposed to talk about it? Forget if they're alive. Let's just say they're still alive. Do you talk about it? I mean, is it is it gossiping or if it's a is it considered gossiping if no. it's a fact? Well, it depends what it is, you know. It it really depends uh it's not gossiping. It well, it well, you know, there's a there's a lot there's an intricate literature about Lashon Hara that's very voluminous and intricate. Uh, many, many of our sages argued that even to mention something terrible that's factual about a person would constitute Lashon Hara, e- even if it's true. Yeah. I remember uh, at some point uh, some, 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 some scandal eat. broke out in the greater Los Angeles Jewish community and two people I know uh, well in the community knew about it way before most people did and they made an inner pledge not to tell anyone even though in today's age everybody's going to find out I find out eventually because everything is on Google and this and that <laughs> they decided we are not passing this message on right and that's probably the the Jewish way it's the hardest way because there's something about us that wants to tell when there is exciting news, whether it's negative news or positive news. It's part of human nature. But you know, you know, in the end, I think that the person that is saying the bad things about the other person, even if it's true, somehow it always reflects poorly on the person saying it. I agree. I agree. And that's probably why it's just not a good idea. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, exactly. if someone's going to walk in the door and it's going to cause them to get shot, then you know, yeah, don't go in there. This person's a lunatic shooting mm-hmm. people. But you know, you don't want to have someone lose their life or be injured. Do it, but short of that, it's mm-hmm. like, what's the point? I used mm-hmm. to say to my coworker, just pray for her. Yeah. Just pray. That's what mm-hmm. I used to say. Well, pray. it's very interesting you say that because you know what they say in Texas. Bless her heart. Just pray before we, <laughs> before we go to work. Just pray after we leave. Because she the, will do the, so there, many. There's a woman in the Talmud yeah. known as a righteous woman called Bruya. She was married to a sage called Rabbi Meir. And Rabbi Meir, um, you know, he had his temperament. You know, if he, he had terrible neighbors. And he used to say, you know, the hell, the hell with them. And and his wife would always tell him, um, when you, when you pray, don't pray for the demise of um, the wicked, but pray for the demise of evil. Oh, really? Right. It's it's two different things. So Not the person, but the evilness of the person. Not the evil oh. person, but evilness, so to speak. In Hebrew. It's not the rasha, but the resha. Not the evil person, but the evilness. Uh, so it's... Um, That's what you want to have die. Sorry? The evilness, right. not the person. Right, exactly. So that's the ver- Now, notice the end of our verse. Verse 14 says, Don't curse, don't curse a deaf person. Don't put a stumbling block, a, a, an obstacle before the blind. And, and fear your, your God... I am the Lord. Yeah. What does it mean, fear your God? It means, is anybody going to know if, 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 you, if, you're, if you're doing something, <laughs> you know, um, somebody, uh, I once walked into a certain store, but I realized I made a mistake. There was another store of the same business that had a very similar name down the road. And I asked him, I'm sorry, I was looking for the other store. It's like, what do you need? It's like, no, I'm sorry, I really need to go to the other store. I apologize. Uh, and, he, and he told me, oh, it's way, way too far. It's miles and miles and miles away. Whatever it is, whatever it may be, probably not the best example, the one I gave, but maybe nobody's going to know. But if you have fear of God, then God is going to know, which means your soul is going to be contaminated. Right? You're going to pay a price for it. It's going to leave an imprint on your soul. There's going to be spiritual accountability for you. So, you know, there's a part of us 
that's always saying, yeah, but who's going to know? Well, God's going to know, which also means you're corrupt, corrupting your own inner fabric. That's what's going on. So that, so that sort of having a moral code of right mm -hmm. and wrong, and and therefore that statement is saying, you, by fearing God, that means I want you to have a conscience. Right. Is that it? Yes. Yes. So it's a it's a direct order to have a conscience. I mean, it's a direct command to have a conscience. I agree. I agree. Oh my God, that's big. Sure. And you see that. Fear of God, fear of God all over the place. That's correct. It is. Yeah. It's repeated several times. All the time. Yeah, all over the Torah. All so verse time. 15. So the commandment really is then, as he said, is to have a moral code. Yeah. Right. So have verse 15, we, we have uh, no, a lot. Right we're running out of time, so let's okay. focus on the Torah so we can Sorry. get more done. No, it's okay. Um, Too much Torah chit-chat. <laughs> well, Torah chit-chat is a good thing. Uh, verse 15. Uh, don't commit, don't perpetrate iniquity in a court of law. In other words, don't commit uh, injustice in court. Lotisaf neidal. Don't elevate the face of the impoverished, and velote And don't aggrandize the face of a of a great man. You shall judge your fellow with tzedek, with justice, with righteousness. In other words, there are people who always favor um, the poor. You know, so, you know, I see that sometimes in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. No matter what happens, they favor the Palestinians yeah. because they feel the, the Palestinians, Palestinians are, you know, they are poor. Yeah. So the Torah yeah, huh? says, no, you have to look for justice. If somebody is poor, but they're committing crimes against humanity or they're not willing to compromise or they're, they're at fault, then you can't have two people coming into your court of law if you're Judge Judy or Judge Judith. And one of them is a lawyer, a well-to-do <laughs> lawyer. The other one is, um, you know, is, is very poor. Say, oh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for the poor guy because he's poor. Don't do that. And, and of course, vice versa. But, you know, even Don't favor country, a celebrity or a person who has power over a person who's powerless. We call that reverse discrimination in this country, right. and it was oh, rampant, especially in the 70s, and still goes on to a great extent. Mm -hmm. now, now notice verse 16. Verse 16 is also a, a beautiful verse. Uh, Don't go gossiping amongst your people. Now the Hebrew uh, for gossip is rechilut. Here it says rachil. It comes from the word rochel. Rochel is a pebbler. A pebbler, or it's a peddler, I'm sorry. A peddler, right? The person who is a traveling salesman. Oh, who, yeah. Who That's goes from door to door and says, you know, I'm selling here uh, Duracell batteries and uh, shoes. What do you want to buy? That's a peddler. So gossip in Judaism, in Hebrew, is peddlerism. You're passing on the merchandise. What's the word you said in Hebrew? Rachil. Oh, I see it here, Rachil. Right? So, in other words, don't be part of that business of spreading, going door to door, so to speak, and, and, and selling that dubious merchandise of, uh, of unworthy speech. And the second component of the verse is also very beautiful. Lota amod al dam reecha. Don't stand idly by your neighbor's blood. In other words, you know, the people during the Holocaust who saw, you know, a third of the neighborhood vacated, all the Jewish people. And it's like, oh, we oh. had no idea. Yeah, yeah. We had no well, idea. What's that smell? Right. Oh, I don't know why. I thought we were barbecuing. So, um... So, so that's exactly uh, what's going on here. Don't stay silent, right? As Einstein once said, uh, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good people to stay silent, right? Incidentally, the other day, somebody showed me something, um, <coughs> um, a, a great Einstein quote, which is, not everything that counts can be counted. It's good, right? You understand what he means? 
you can't count friendship. Can you count friendship? Can you count love? Can you count calculate, in other words? Can you calculate, quantify friendship, love, loyalty, faith, uh, morality, nobility, right? Compassion. You can't quantify those things. Not everything that counts can be counted. It's a great, it's, I, I really like that line. I like uh, that too. Yeah. So, um, so what else do we have here? What was that other thing that you quoted? You said when, um, earlier you just... Oh, said, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to stay silent. Right. Uh, verse 17, don't hate your brother in your heart. Baseless, you know, hatreds in, 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 in families and within the Jewish people, as common as they may be, are devastating and tragic. Right? Uh, even in your heart. You shall rebuke your fellow. You have a responsibility to set somebody right. Now there's an intricate rabbinic literature about this mitzvah. How do you rebuke someone, right? Somebody just walked to me after the morning minion and says, this guy dropped his tefillin on the floor. Maybe you should tell him something, Rabbi. So some people might fast if they drop their tefillin or study a portion of Torah or give tzedakah. But how do you, or if somebody makes a mistake, let's say at work, you know, how do you give someone uh, constructive criticism? Right? When, how, and to whom is it appropriate? There's a whole rabbinic discussion about this verse. Right? Sometimes if you're going to rebuke someone or, or offer them what you think is constructive criticism, they're only going to become enraged and develop antagonism towards you. So you have to think, am I in a position to do it? Is there somebody else who can do it that's closer to that person? Is this the right time to do it? Right? Uh, you have to put, there are a lot of factors that go into play here. But I think one thing is for sure. Uh, you know, if you have someone that you're very close to, be it a close friend or a close relative, then in a sense it's, a, it's an obligation that you have to them to give them constructive criticism. You know, I know that there are certain, you know, constructive criticisms that if my wife would give me or a close friend of mine would give me, I would be receptive to, but if somebody else I might feel hurt or defensive, so if you're really close to someone, in a sense, you have an obligation to give them constructive criticism, right? Um, because it's hard to give, and it's maybe even harder to receive criticism, right? So, velotisa alav chet. In other words, if I do have the ability to give someone constructive, constructive criticism and I don't, then, then I am... I, I carry some of the spiritual responsibility because that person is going to keep on doing not the right thing and I could break that pattern. If I don't, I share in the responsibility. Okay? So, so that's sort so, of synonymous to help improve your neighbor. By right. Helping. Verse 18 is no resentment. Uh, don't resent people. Don't begrudge people. Try and let go of gr- the grudges of yesterday. Easier said than done, right? Love your fellow, your neighbor, as you love yourself. We said one of the most famous mitzvot. Uh, the, the, next, the next mitzvah is one of the least understood mitzvot. It's not wearing a garment which is a mixture of wool and linen. It's the quintessential chok. A chok is a, is a mitzvah which is a non-rational mitzvah. <laughs> which to our to our minds you know if it says don't murder don't steal these are the mishpatim the universal mitzvot every civilized society understands those some mitzvot are unique to the Jewish people like refraining from eating chametz on Pesach a chok is an esoteric mitzvah whose rationale escapes us 
when we look at that mitzvah on the face of it, it doesn't seem to have a rationale. Why, why, would, why should I not wear it, buy a suit? For example, most Hugo Boss suits are shotness. They have wool and linen. So what if the suit jacket is made out of both wool and linen? Well, first of all, because the Torah said so. And secondly, our sages sometimes you know, come up with insights as to what are the symbolic meanings of these mitzvot. So I actually uh, read, came across once a beautiful interpretation of this mitzvah. Why not wear a garment that's made of both wool and linen? This is from Professor Shalom Rosenberg, who is a philosoph- Jewish philosopher in Israel. He says, what is wool? Wool is when you shave, sh- uh, shave off a sheep. You take its wool, right? In other words, it's something you took from somebody else. Linen is something you produce yourself. Don't mix the things that you took from somebody else than the things that you earned and toiled for yourself. Right? Sometimes you see people walk with their heads in the clouds because they were born to wealthy parents or because their parents are celebrities or whatever it is. So that's like wool. You didn't earn it. It's what we call in sociology a hereditary status. You know, you didn't lift a pinky to earn that. But linen symbolizes your hard-earned achievements, what we call in sociology sociology, an acquired status. You earned it, right? Your academic degree, your Torah study, whatever it may be, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the salary you earn, whatever it may be whether it's uh, whatever kind of achievement it may be. So, um, so that's also a very important teaching, and we'll conclude with that and say that something like that comes at the very concluding Torah portion of the Torah, which is called Vizot Bracha, and this is the blessing. The Torah itself is the blessing. And Moses says there, Torah tzivalanu Moshe morasha kilat Yaakov. We read it on Simchat Torah, and it's a verse that we say a lot. The Torah was ordained to us by Moses, through Moses. It is uh, a legacy, morasha, for the Jewish people. Not an inheritance, but a legacy. Because an inheritance is monetary, right? Somebody passes away, they leave their apartment to their kid. That's an inheritance. Somebody is uh, uh, knowledgeable in Torah, that's a legacy. You can't just hand it over to your kid. Your kid has to earn it. So, so this is another meaning uh, of this mitzvah, and these are some of the wonderful mitzvot of our holiness code in Parashat Kedoshim. Thank you for joining us. Shabbat Shalom.